Okay, let's go to chapter uh, 5 of 1 Peter, and it's Peter's message, and Peter's message, be clothed with humility, is part of three messages that we see. Humility is clearly taught in the church by three of the New Testament writers. Peter will see this week, Paul will see next week, and James will see, Lord willing, the next week. And basically, Peter's message is, be clothed with humility. That's what we're going to read in 1 Peter 5. Next week, we'll see Paul's message is put on humility. And, and with Paul, the context is in the put off, put ons, the justifying death of Christ, opening the sanctifying life, and humility is a part of that sanctifying work. And then finally, uh, James says, humble yourselves because you're in the sight of the Lord. And it's not humble yourself for people to say, wow, you're so humble. It's humble yourself for the one that knows whether or not there's pride, whether or not there's self-advancement and assertion going on. So we'll see that. Uh, Peter's message, be clothed with humility, is in these verses, and you should be there by now. And let's open, and if you have it, let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word, First Peter 5. And I'm going to read starting in verse 5 down to verse 7. Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Wow. Wow. What a, what a passage. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that before communion, we would have the blessed privilege of understanding that you want us to be clothed with humility. But humility comes attached to other uh, attitudes that are prompted by your spirit. Uh, verse 5, submission. Verse 7, this peacefulness of casting our care. And right in the center, being clothed with humility. And I pray that we'd understand that actually humility is a part of a whole spiritual maturity uh, way of life that you want to see in us. And I pray that we would embrace that and surrender to that today for your glory. Open our eyes and our hearts and stir them by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Um, the key to God's attention is always humility. We saw that last time. God wants us to be clothed with humility. He wants to pour out his grace upon us. And God constantly, presently, and bountifully always pours out grace on humble people. Even wicked Ahab, when he humbled himself, God said, I'm going to not punish him right now. I'm going to wait. God always responds to humility. It draws his attention the last time we were together, we saw that the essence of humility was expressed by the final Old Testament prophet. The greatest man born among women up until this time, Jesus said in Matthew 11, was John the Baptist. And you remember what John the Baptist said. He said in John 3.30 these, these powerful words, seven words to be exact. He must increase, but I must decrease. Think about it. The attitude that leads to humility was summed up by John's testimony. Christ must increase. I must decrease. That's the essence of humility. Seven words that encapsulate what practicing biblical humility is all about. He must increase, but I must decrease. Basically, we are supposed to be seeking to allow Jesus to increase in our life. It is a choice that Jesus Christ is waiting to, to flow into, to overflow, and to overwhelm our life with Christ-likeness. That's what Paul talked about, that, that justification put us in Christ. Sanctification allows Christ loose in our lives. So humility is a part of the work of God of sanctification that we have to cooperate with. So basically, how do we allow this to happen? Uh, 
basically the Bible tells us. Uh, there are, and this is just a chronology of the basics of the Christian life. Christ will always increase in me when his word is more and more eaten as my food on which I live. The more I eat, the more I consume his word, I live by his word. I am filled with, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Uh, we, we feed on him and then he increases in our lives. Secondly, Christ will increase when his attitudes are reflected in me as I learn from him. That's what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and you're just struggling with life, and take my yoke upon you. In other words, submit to me and learn from me. What do we learn? I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Right there in Matthew 11 is the sacred trio that we're going to look at this morning. Submissiveness, humbleness, peacefulness. It all comes when Christ increases. Christ will increase when his attitudes are reflected in me, when I submit to learn from him. Christ will also increase when his actions are empowered through me. Uh, as, as Galatians 2.20 says, it no longer is I who live, but Christ in me. Paul said, I can't tell where I end and where Christ begins. It's just Christ is in me. And it's not me anymore that's living. It's Christ in me living. Most of us don't have that problem. We know right where we end, and we know right where we begin. And Christ is, you know, kind of trying to fit in between. But Christ increases when it's more and more a surrender to him, not I, that's living. And it's all about him, not me. It's his actions empowered through me, so it becomes no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Fourthly, when his compassion is lived out in me, Christ increases. Uh, that's, that's what Colossians 3, we'll see that next week. That, that we are supposed to allow Christ's compassion to be, the, to be the black tag, sit and touch and sing and pray, passion of our heart. That we go toward the needy, the sick, the lost, the blind, those in darkness, with his compassion. And like Christ, we seek to save those who are lost. And then his priorities are embraced by me. Christ increases when I am like Philippians 2.5. I let this mind be in me. I want his priorities. I want his plan to be my plan in my life. And finally, Christ will increase when his will is embraced as my goal. You know, it says in John 6.38, Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. And that's why he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, not my will. He prayed it over and over. It's a, it's a repetitive tense. He constantly kept saying, not my will, not my will, but yours be done. So that's the goal. Christ increase, I decrease. Now, look at the amazing context of 1 Peter 5. I mean, remember, no verse in the Bible is just hanging out there. It isn't like an ornament on a tree. It's attached to like a vein of ore. Every verse in the Bible has a context, and that context, just like salt when its mind picks up the minerals that surround it, every verse is, is totally framed by the context it comes from. What's the context of all this submit, humble, and trust in 1 Peter 5? Well, basically, the book of 1 Peter is a book set against a backdrop of impending persecution. Paul is back in prison awaiting execution. Peter is on the run. And Peter chose the most difficult place in the world to minister at that time. And he lived in the center of all that was Rome, and suffering was coming. In fact, if you turn to 1 Peter 4.12, first century believers, even as Peter was writing, it says in verse 12, we're facing what he called fiery trials. Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That phrase could read the painful trial that burns among you. Now you can imagine what the, the first century readers were thinking. They were thinking of Nero burning people in his garden. That's what he did in Rome. He was burning Christians alive as a form of martyrdom and execution and persecution. At the very least, Peter was describing an experience of pain that was comparable to the pain of being burned with fire. And that's what he was saying they were going through. Suffering is big in First Peter. There are no less than 15 times, there are more, but there's no less than 15 times Peter describes suffering. But what's amazing is, in those 15 references, 
he uses eight different Greek words. In other words, he exhausts the Greek language's vocabulary of the ways we suffer. And he uses all of them with these people because they were facing these fiery trials. But what's neat is, look at verse 13. First century believers were experiencing divine comfort. They could rejoice, verse 13, uh, to the extent that they partook of Christ's sufferings, to, to the extent that they said, this suffering is at your hand because everything comes to me through your hand. Everything comes to me either because you allowed it or because you directly caused it. But I believe you're so powerful that nothing comes into my life except at your hand. And that's what verse 12 is talking about. And our suffering is the same kind of thing Christ received. And therefore, in some sense, it's an indication of our identification with Christ. But look at verse 19. Uh, in, in 1 Peter 4, 19, first century believers knew that God allowed no accidents. You know, we kind of forget the script. We forget the word. And a lot of people talk about this accidental this and accidental death and accidental this. And there is no accidents for us. Look what it says in verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. In this one verse, we can see the content of the whole letter summarized. We believe, as believers, do not suffer accidentally, nor we do go through affliction because of some irresistible forces of fate. This is why we want to daily renew our surrender. The Peter word that's used in the Spirit prompted Peter to use in verse 19, commit, literally means entrust yourself for safekeeping. We're supposed to put ourselves in the safety deposit box of God's care. And, and actually, every day say, I'm, I'm in the safety deposit box of your care, and anything that gets into this secure location is not an accident. It's at your hand, and I trust you. The book of Peter is an epistle of hope portrayed against this backdrop of suffering. So that takes us to chapter 5. So now you should be in chapter 5. And in here... God says that submission is the first step on the pathway to spiritual maturity, and humility follows submission. See, you've you got to get the, the order here. Basically, humility is seen in submissiveness, and it leads to peacefulness. These are all connected in verses 5, 6, and 7. You can't jerk out the humble yourself in verse 6 without seeing 5 and 7. 5 says that humility starts with an attitude of submissiveness. And it leads, the submissiveness leads to humility, which issues into peacefulness. So humility is seen in submissiveness, and it leads to peacefulness. And peacefulness comes by humility and submission, and submission leads to humility and peace. And that, that sacred trio of spiritual maturity is what this whole epistle is about. And so what God is saying is this, that submission is the pathway to getting the grace to live this way. Look what it says in verse 5 again. We've read it over and over, but it says, likewise, you younger people, before we get to humility, look what it says, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So submission is that pathway to the grace that's going to come in verse 6. But submission is that first spiritually mature attitude that must be ours. The first choice on the pathway to spiritual maturity is submissiveness. All believers submit to one another's God-designed roles because we all submit to God. That's what verse 5 says. God's answer is always we first submit to him. And then we choose to clothe ourselves with humility. Jesus could lay aside his outer garments in the upper room and tie on the apron of the slave to wash the disciples' feet because he had already submitted, John 6, 38, to do the will of his Father. Submission precedes the clothing with humility. And that's why a lot of people are never humble because they're never submissive. The pride that keeps them unsubmissive to anybody telling them what to do 
is what precludes them from the grace that comes through clothing ourselves with humility. Only God's grace can enable us to submit to other believers, to submit to ungodly governments, and to work authorities we don't like. But when we do, God makes all grace abound toward us as we submit. So God says humility is the pathway to spiritual maturity. Look what he continues saying. Verse 5, submit yourselves. All of you submit to one another. Then in verse 5, be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he can exalt you in due time. The second choice on the pathway to spiritual maturity after submissiveness is humbleness. God will always resist pride in any form in our lives because he hates pride. And God desires us to clothe ourselves with humility. But we won't respond to that unless we've already chosen to submit to him. That's part of what obedience to his word is, a submission, whether I like it, understand it, or agree with it. I submit to the mighty hand of God. So amazingly, what God says is that the only medication, the only antidote that defeats pride is God's grace. And the only pathway to that grace is submissiveness. And so we must understand that grace enables us to clothe ourselves with humility. And the evidence of the grace of submission is when we submit humbly to one another. They're so tied together. A humble person can't submit. A submissive person is never able to resist the, the grace that prompts them to humble themselves. And that even more floods them with grace upon grace. Submission is very hard because it requires we trust God more than ourselves. When we entrust ourselves to God, he can allay our fears. Notice it says, the mighty hand of God that we humbly submit to. That mighty hand is able to take care of anyone or anything around us. And see, that's why these are all connected. And therefore, spiritual maturity, understanding submissiveness and humbleness leads to a life of peacefulness. That's why a lot of people aren't very peaceful, because they're not very humble, because they're certainly not very submissive. And, and they pick and choose. They submit to what they agree with. They submit to what they like. They resist what they don't agree with and what they don't like. And that's pride. And that leads to a very peaceless life. And the Bible said that's not God's plan. Spiritual maturity prompts the attitude of peacefulness. Look at verse 7. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. The final choice on the pathway to spiritual maturity after submissiveness and humbleness is peacefulness. A submissive and humble person wants to walk in obedience with the God of the universe who has clearly asked us to cast all our cares. Notice what verse 7 says, all. God wants to take care of our troubles, our cares, our burdens, but without the first two attitudes, he can't. Without submission and humility, we never get the benefit of his mighty hand. They're connected. It isn't a la carte. You can't get one without the other. They're, they're a package. Therefore, in 1 Peter 5, 7, that word that's translated care in English comes from a Greek word that's rich in meaning. It literally means anxiety or the state of being pulled apart. And that's what most people are. They're in the state of being pulled apart by all their anxieties and troubles and fears and discontents. And, and, and it, it just is not a picture of God's grace. And God asks for us to gather up and consciously unload all of our burdens, all of our discontentment, all of our troubles, every anxious thought, all of our fears, and all of those pains, and unload them onto him. It's almost like God is the divine dumpster. He walks alongside us through every moment of every day in our life, saying, cast your burdens on the Lord. That's, that's Psalm 55, 22. In fact, this verse 7 is almost an exposition by Peter of Psalm 55, 22. 
Basically, this is what the Lord is saying. Throw all of those heavy, painful, sharp, poisonous, debilitating, enduring, injurious thoughts and attitudes on me. They are just wearing you down. My mighty hand will hold all of your sorrows, all of your woes, all of your pains, and all of your fears. You can't do it. They will injure your relationship when you hold on to them. And they will distract you away from looking at me with the eyes of faith and with a heart of love. Actually, the verb that the Spirit of God inspired Peter to use makes it so clear. It's a casting in the aorist tense. It means a once and for all throwing it in the dumpster. And then when any more show up, you just let them follow into the dumpster. You say, uh, I've already put all those in there, and you belong in there too. And by faith, we say no. We are going to give over all of our past cares, all of our present cares, and all of our future cares to God. We don't sort them. We don't keep the ones we can handle or think we can handle. We give them all to him. He wants them all. Remember, they belong to the Lord, not us. He said, all your cares belong to me. So basically, humility is letting Christ increase as we submit to him, as we clothe ourselves with his attitude, with his meek and lowly humbleness, as we trust him. And what happens? We have peace. What happens is that, that all of our cares are no longer ours but his. And basically, God has said that submissiveness, humbleness, and peacefulness are tied together, interconnected, and mutually interdependent. God's answer is always that we first submit to him, then choose to clothe ourselves with humility, and then entrust our lives. Do you know what communion is? It's when we surrender to God's way. God's way is submissiveness, humbleness, and this peacefulness that comes of casting our cares because we humbly can't take care of them ourselves because we've already submitted to his mighty hand. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and as we bow, I invite our elders and deacons to go and begin to prepare to serve us. But I invite each one of us who are sitting here with heads bowed before the Lord to really honestly ask yourself, have you truly put everything in the dumpster? Have you cast every care on him? Are you submissive to God? Are you humbly submissive to those around you? Do you have that peacefulness or is life tearing you apart? Communion is when we look at the settings that God designed and we invite the Lord to reset us to the way he designed us to operate at the point of our salvation. Because in the week or the months that we allow it to be, we get all unset. So communion is when we come and say, reset me, Lord, back to your original settings. Father, I pray that this would be a communion of surrendering anew to submitting ourselves to God, to you, and submitting ourselves to those you have placed over us in the government, uh, in business, in our homes, in your church. And then humbly allowing you to clothe us with your meek and lowliness of mind. And then casting anew and afresh all of our cares back on you once and for all and any that show up, throw them in the dumpster. I pray that this communion will be a renewal or a beginning of our surrender to you. Thank you for this bread, a picture that you gave your body to become our sin. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.